Um, hi, uh, thanks so much for that lovely introduction. Uh, I'm really honored to speak today at this institution that was basically built by many of my heroes and mentors, and I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, I'll be speaking today uh, about the new approaches in managing atrial fibrillation and specifically about hybrid ablation, which is a new and emerging therapy, and I have no disclosures. So my objectives today are to discuss why atrial fibrillation treatment is important, uh, to outline the evolution of procedural, procedural treatment of atrial fibrillation from the Cox maze procedure all the way to current hybrid uh, approaches, and to increase awareness of emerging therapies that offer treatment for patients with non-paroxysmal atrial fibrillation who previously had limited treatment options. So I'll start with a case study. Um, several years ago, um, a 77-year-old man came to my office. Uh, he had a history of hypertension, sleep apnea. He was on CPAP. Uh, he was obese. And he had had paroxysmal AFib um, for a few years, but then developed longstanding persistent AFib in 2016. Uh, he was on the typical medications, uh, Eliquis. He was on amiodarone and some beta blockers. Uh, he had had some prior treatment with one pulmonary vein isolation, which was an endocardial ablation, uh, one uh, cardioversion, uh, which did achieve normal sinus rhythm, but he quickly went back into AFib within a week after that procedure. Um, he had very significant symptoms with severe fatigue, shortness of breath, and palpitations, which significantly impaired his daily activities. Uh, his ejection fraction was normal, and he had no valve or coronary disease. He had a severely dilated left atrium by CTA measuring greater than six centimeters. Uh, this was a man, a really nice guy, uh, who was just desperate for relief from his AFib symptoms. Uh, he stated he was becoming progressively depressed and hopeless. Uh, he had a young grandson, and he said the only thing he wanted with the rest of his life was just to play with his grandson, and he wasn't even able to pick him up because he was so symptomatic. So, you know, he was told by multiple doctors that Long-standing persistent AFib really didn't have any other viable treatment options other than what he was already on, which was medical, medical treatment. So the main question for this patient and many patients like him is, can we do better for them uh, than just commit them to a lifetime of medications, progressive disease, and symptoms? And so that's going to be the subject of my talk. I want to quickly define the different types of atrial fibrillation. Um, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is AFib that resolves within seven days of onset. Um, what I'm going to be speaking on uh, specifically is non-paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which consists of persistent AFib, which is continuous AFib beyond seven days, and long-standing persistent AFib, which is continuous AFib more than 12 months. And we know that non-paroxysmal AFib is a real treatment challenge uh, because of the differences among patients. So this is an important slide uh, that I like to show because it kind of sums up everything we need to know about AFib. Um, the AFib risk factors, which are here on the left, induce structural changes to the atrium that then lead to fibrosis, inflammation, and cellular changes, and then these lead to AFib. Uh, when AFib starts and becomes persistent, then that leads to even further electrical and structural remodeling that promotes more AFib. So hence the term that's, that's uh, stated quite a bit uh, is AFib begets AFib. And that explains the cycle that causes progression from paroxysmal to non-paroxysmal and then to permanent AFib. And then AFib also leads to um, you know, worse cardiovascular outcomes, which are shown to the right, uh, which are stroke, heart failure, heart attack, dementia, uh, and uh, also decrease quality of life. When you think AFib, you should always think stroke. Uh, this is one of the biggest concerns of fears with all patients with atrial fibrillation. And we know that AFib increases stroke risk by fivefold, and that those strokes related to AFib are usually much worse than those not related to AFib. Uh, so this is a significant uh, focus uh, for the patient specifically. And we know that the burden of AFib begins within months of diagnosis and can be best broken down into two different categories. The patient health costs with risk of stroke, heart failure, risk, increased risk of death, decreased quality of life and, and increased dementia, as well as other things. Uh, and then the major economic cost. Uh, a patient with AFib uh, is, is said to spend over $8,000 per year uh, compared to a patient without AFib just on their medical treatment alone. And in the US, uh, the estimated healthcare costs from AFib is greater than $26 billion per year. So this is a huge and costly problem that desperately needs a better solution. So the primary treatment for AFib has 
you know, is medical treatment uh, with either rate or rhythm control and anticoagulation. Uh, but current research favors earlier procedural interventions to restore normal sinus rhythm and to reduce AFib and its progression and complications. Um, so the procedural treatments for AFib consist of endocardial ablation, uh, which is done by an EP cardiologist. And we know that this is an excellent treatment for paroxysmal AFib. Uh, however, it's really difficult to treat patients with non-paroxysmal AFib using this technique. It could re require multiple uh, repeat ablations uh, and can lead to complications like esophageal injury uh, or phrenic nerve injury. And the techniques I'll cover more today uh, involve surgery. Uh, so the traditional AFib surgery uh, is the Cox maze procedure. It is an in invasive and uh, invasive surgery with a prolonged recovery time. Uh, it does, however, still remain the gold standard for surgical treatment of AFib. It can be technically challenging and complex, and it does require cardiopulmonary bypass and cardiac arrest. It can be done with an open sternotomy or minimal access, and it does have uh, reported high, high long-term success rates of greater than 85% success long-term. Uh, what I'm going to focus on here is our hybrid procedures, uh, which are newer techniques that combine both an endocardial and epicardial ablation. Uh, so there's both a surgical and an electrophysiology procedure involved, and it provides maximal treatment, uh, but through a minimally invasive and off-pump approach. Um, I'm also going to talk briefly about closure of the left atrial appendage, which is a very important component of treatment of AFib and stroke prevention. And this can also be done with concomitant surgery or also as a standalone procedure. So I'm going to start with and kind of go back to the beginning of AFib surgical treatment, which is the Cox maze procedure. Uh, it was a surgical treatment uh, for AFib that was first perform performed back in 1987 by Dr. James Cox in St. Louis. And the maze pattern of lesions was chosen uh, to prevent the multiple erratic AFib impulses from propagating through the heart to cause AFib. Uh, but it should also leave behind the ability to activate both atria to achieve normal sinus rhythm. So this diagram shows the traditional cut and sew Cox maze three procedure, which is still the basis of all ablations and treatments for AFib. Uh, it remains the gold standard treatment for chronic AFib. The full Cox maze lesion set, which is shown here, it is highly effective, but as you can imagine by looking at the image, uh, it's rarely used today because it's, it, it was very complex. The technique involved making multiple left and right atrial incisions and sewing them back together. And then those incision lines uh, formed a set of scars, which isolated the pulmonary veins, the posterior left atrium and the right atrium leading to decreased AFib. So, Again, just looking, looking at the, uh, the diagram, you can see why it's not used very much these days. The newer, the newer form of the Cox maze is the Cox maze 4. Uh, and with evolution of devices uh, and ablation technology, many of the incision lines that were used in the Cox maze 3 are now replaced uh, by uh, these different uh, devices and techniques. Uh, bipolar radiofrequency or cryoablation are the devices shown here to the right. Uh, and they're often used in addition to some incision lines. This creates a much easier, quicker, and a much safer operation, but with the same end goal as the Cox Maze 3. Uh, this can be performed through minimally invasive or through an open chest. It does require cardiopulmonary bypass and cardiac arrest, just like the Cox Maze 3, and it can be done with either alone uh, or with other cardiac procedures as well. And I'm showing this image because the lesion lines here to the left are the basis of a lot of the hybrid uh, management for AFib, which I'm gonna um, show. Um, doc, Dr. Ralph Damiano and his group uh, did a review uh, of many uh, papers looking at the Cox maze 3 and Cox maze 4 studies in 2017, comparing these two treatments for AFib. And the results of those are excellent. Uh, the Cox maze 4 has similar results uh, to the Cox maze 3 at one year, uh, but out to five years, that's slightly uh, reduced at about 85% freedom from AFib at five years. Um, but again, uh, these outcomes uh, are what pretty much all the other therapies that we uh, produce are trying to achieve. So hybrid ablations for AFib, it's a collaborative effort between an electrophysiologist and cardiac surgeon, and it produces a complementary lesion set on the heart, both inside endocardial and outside or epicardial lesions. By combining these two pro approaches, it's possible to replicate most of the Cox maze four lesions, but without cardiopulmonary bypass, which of course is a great advantage. And these off-pump hybrid minimally invasive procedures are much more appealing to patients and doctors, uh, but they still provide excellent AFib reduction. Uh, 
And so the, the types of hybrid ablations I'm gonna speak specifically about today are the convergent approach or the convergent plus and the hybrid totally thoracoscopic ab uh, ablation. So in 2021, uh, the Epicense unipolar radio frequency device, which is the device that's used in the convergent approach, it was approved by the FDA for treatment of long-standing persistent AFib. Um, the, the convergent, like I said, it consists of two procedures. Uh, they're usually staged uh, four to six weeks apart. The first procedure is a surgical epicardial ablation, and the second part is an endocardial mapping and ablation by an electrophysiologist. And I'm gonna go over those details. There's two targeted patient groups for the convergent ablation. Those that have long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation or AFib more than a year, uh, and those with persistent AFib, but who have had uh, recurrence after other endocardial ablations or treatments. And I'm, before I go too much into this, I'm gonna um, describe uh, specifically how the convergent approach is performed. So we begin with a surgical procedure and under general anesthesia, a transesophageal echo is done uh, to rule out any presence of a left atrial thrombus. Uh, if we do see a thrombus, uh, uh, we have to abort the procedure due to the risk of embolization and stroke. But if the heart's clear, then we proceed with the procedure. A subxiphoid pericardial window is then performed and a cannula with a thoracoscope is placed in the posterior pericardium behind the heart. This video shows the surgical procedure. So through the cannula and the subxiphoid window, the scope and the Epicense device are inserted into the posterior pericardium. The device then creates uh, multiple three centimeter linear radiofrequency ablation lines to completely cover the posterior left atrial wall between the pulmonary veins. And one benefit of this epicardial ablation approach is that the ablation energy and heat is directed away from the esophagus and directly toward the heart, which decreases the chance of esophageal injury. Four weeks later then, uh, or four to six weeks or more, um, the endocardial mapping and catheter ablation is done uh, by an EP cardiologist to treat any gaps in ablation lines or any areas that aren't able to be reached with a first part uh, epicardial approach. And it also ensures transmurality of the lesions uh, from the surgical procedure. So the completed lesion set is shown here uh, to the left. In blue are the epicardial or surgical uh, ablation lines, and in the red are the endocardial lesions. The goal is debulking uh, basically the substrate of tissue that causes AFib, which is the posterior left atrial wall and the pulmonary veins. The entire posterior left atrial wall should be ablated, and that's, that's the goal of both procedures together. And the end result is similar to the box lesion from the Cox maze procedure, which isolates the left posterior atrial wall and the pulmonary veins. And of note, this procedure um, does not involve any right-sided atrial lesions. And it also, um, uh, when convergence done alone, does not close the left atrial appendage. So the Converge clinical trial in March of 2021, uh, the results of this trial were published and it was a prospective multi-center randomized clinical trial that demonstrated improved effectiveness of the hybrid convergent procedure over traditional endocardial catheter ablation alone, especially in patients with persistent AFib. And the primary uh, endpoint was freedom from AFib through 12 months and secondary endpoint included at least a greater than 90% uh, AFib burden reduction. So this just shows the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the study. Um, uh, the inclusion cr criteria were patients uh, with persistent AFib or those with refractory uh, or intolerant or who had refractory AFib or were intolerant to anti uh, arrhythmic drugs. The exclusion criteria were if they had any prior cardiac surgery, if they had other concomitant cardiac issues requiring surgery, if they had um, heart failure or EF less than 40, uh, or if they had had any prior left atrial catheter ablations for AFib, they were excluded. So these were all virgin hearts in this study. And this study was unique because it had no limit on AFib duration or left atrial size. So it makes it one of the only ablation trials to include a very large portion of patients with long-standing persistent AFib. Uh, and in the study, the AFib duration uh, was about six years and the left atrial size was just over four centimeters. So the converged trial was conducted at 27 sites in the US and UK, and it studied 153 patients with drug refractory, 
um, at least one, and they were on at least one class, uh, class one or class two antiarrhythmic drug, and they had symptomatic and long-standing persistent AFib. Uh, patients were randomized two to one into the hybrid convergent arm versus the endocardial catheter ablation arm alone. Um, and of note, the endocardial ablations were performed only with radiofrequency energy uh, during this trial. Uh, no cryoablation catheters were used. Uh, and during this trial, um, the left atrial appendage was not closed. Uh, and I'll get to the importance of that later. So the longstanding persistent AFib subanalysis of the study showed excellent results that led to the FDA label for treatment of longstanding persistent uh, atrial fibrillation with this technique. A total of 42 patients in the study had longstanding persistent AFib, which we know is difficult to treat. Um, and the trial demonstrated superiority of the hybrid AFib therapy compared to endocardial catheter ablation alone. Uh, the outcomes of this study were met, which were freedom from AFib, at least a 94% AFib burden reduction and improved AFib symptoms out to 18 months. Um, so this shows um, some of the results. So freedom from AFib and at least a 90% AFib burden reduction was, slight, was significantly better with a convergent versus endocardial ablation alone. And this was sustained through 18 months. So the diagram on the left shows that 71% of the patients who received hybrid treatment um, had freedom from AFib at 12 months compared to 51% in those receiving endocardial catheter ablation alone. Um, at 18 months, uh, which is on the right, uh, that freedom from AFib was sustained uh, to about 63% in the hybrid uh, ablation arm versus 43% in the catheter ablation group. So this leads to an absolute success rate difference of 20%, which favors hybrid convergent uh, versus endocardial catheter ablation for these patients. Convergent patients also had very significant improvement of their symptoms. Uh, and this graph shows that in every symptom that was measured out to a year, palpitations, shortness of breath, exercise intolerance, fatigue, uh, et cetera. Um, the pre-op the pre uh, um, rate is shown on the left and the post-op rate is shown on the right. And in every category, the symptoms were extremely um, improved uh, leading to um, symptom reduction for those patients. Uh, and the patients also had a very significant uh, reduction in the need for cardioversion post-op. Uh, the convergent approach was proven to be safe. Uh, there were no deaths, no cardiac perforations, or, and no atrial esophageal fistulas. There was one pericardial effusion, one stroke, and one temporary nerve injury, or I'm sorry, one temporary phrenic nerve injury. So the, revert, the results of the convergent trial show that there, it had superior outcomes of the hybrid convergent procedure compared to endocardial catheter ablation alone with drug refractory and long-standing persistent AFib. And those uh, results were carried out to 18 months. Um, and it also showed that uh, this procedure is safe and a collaborative heart team approach helps improve outcomes in difficult to treat patients with atrial fibrillation. This is just a, a slide showing a lot of other studies. These, these are, you know, it's, it's very busy. Uh, a lot of other studies, most, most of them were, um, uh, clinical series uh, kind of early on in the days of uh, the convergent trial. Uh, and when you add them all together and do a re review, there were 687 patients that underwent uh, the convergent procedure. And at one year, um, all these uh, studies together uh, showed about an 86% chance of uh, uh, sinus rhythm uh, with this procedure. So the convergent plus approach, kind of shifting gears a little bit, the convergent plus is what I personally perform in my own practice and is what's being used by most surgeons uh, around the nation. It adds a little bit to the traditional convergent um, to produce further optimization against AFib. It includes the previously described study um, that was in the converged trial, but it adds a left thoracoscopy with closure of the left atrial appendage using a clip from the epicardial surface and this reduces stroke reduction as well as it improves uh, your AFib burden by 10%. Uh, we also divide the ligament of Marshall, which is a structure thought to be important in AFib, and additional ablation lines like on the left atrial roof, near the pulmonary veins, at the base of the appendage, and at the cumin ridge are able to be added for increased uh, AFib reduction. So now I'm going to shift to uh, a different procedure, which is another procedure um, but it's uh, more extensive in nature. And uh, this is the hybrid totally thoracoscopic maze. Um, 
it uses a, a team, uh, just like the Convergent, with a cardiac surgeon and an electrophysiologist. And it comes closer to actually replicating the full Cox Maze 4 lesion set, but without the need for cardiopulmonary bypass or cardiac arrest. It's technically much more challenging than Convergent Plus approach. Um, and there are currently only a few centers around the US that offer this approach. It does provide ablation lines to both the right and left atria, like the Cox Maze 4. Uh, and the one year freedom from AFib uh, is said to be about 80% in several studies. So in the operating room, uh, this is how the patient is positioned. Um, and uh, port placement for this totally thoracoscopic surgical ablation um, involves uh, both access to the right chest and to the left chest using four small ports on each side for bilateral um, access to the heart. This diagram outlines the resulting lesions, which come close to a full Cox maze for procedure. Um, there are biatrial epicardial lesions, both in the right and left atrium. The um, uh, left atrial appendages is also closed using an epicardial clip device. And then the second stage endocardial catheter uh, mapping ablation is performed to complete these lesions. And a recent study uh, published by um, Dr. Pat McCarthy and James Cox um, showed excellent results with a uh, totally thoracoscopic maze, uh, reaching a one-year freedom from AFib off of antiarrhythmic drugs of 85%. Similarly, um, Dr. Gan Dunnington and his group out in California uh, published their single center long-term clinical outcomes of the hybrid totally thoracoscopic maze in a large cohort of 455 patients. Uh, their results were reported, out, were reported out to three years with very promising results. Uh, at one year, freedom from AFib was 87% with antiarrhythmic drugs and 81% without antiarrhythmic drugs. These initial results were good, but they did lack some of the same durability at three years uh, that we saw with the Cox maze procedures. Uh, the graph to the right shows the, that over time, out to three years, uh, the freedom from AFib does decrease to about 72% uh, with um, with antiarrhythmic drugs and 66% uh, freedom from AFib off antiarrhythmic drugs. Uh, this procedure is still evolving um, as an off pump option for AFib. And I'm sure there will be more on this approach in the future. It's still in its early days of, um, of adoption, uh, but there will be more to come. So the next question is, is hybrid ablation safe and effective for patients with heart failure? Uh, because we know that restoration of normal sinus rhythm is uh, extremely beneficial, especially for this patient group. Um, so this is a second paper, um, also from Dr. Um, uh, Dunnington and his group in California, the same group of patients that um, that previous uh, paper described, um, and the same cohort looking at a subset of those patients with a th totally thoracoscopic maze in patients with an EF lower than 40%. And it, it was a uh, basically, at, it was effective uh, with greater than 60% uh, chance of freedom from AFib at one year in this very high risk group. And it was also shown to be very safe even in these uh, high risk patients with no strokes or death. And this just visually shows the results from the procedure. Um, so, uh, on the left, it shows that patients that started with an EF less than 40% in this group after hybrid ablation, um, they had an increase in their ejection fraction of about 12%. And then on the right, it, that shows that it, patients usually started with a New York Heart, Heart Association class at least two or three. And after the hybrid approach, um, a significant number of those patients went down to a New York Heart, Heart Association class one. So significantly helping these patients with heart failure. So left atrial appendage closure should also be a very integral part of any AFib treatment because it reduces the arrhythmia burden approximately 10% by electrically isolating the appendage, and it also prevents stroke and thromboembolism. And epicardial closure um, can be surgically placed either through an open surgery with other heart um, uh, uh, concomitant uh, procedures going on or also minimally invasive. Over 300,000 of these epicardial clips have been used worldwide and it's extremely safe and effective. Um, it can also be done as a standalone procedure for patients who can't tolerate uh, anticoagulants uh, who just need closure of their left atrial appendage. Uh, 
This is done through a uh, left thoracoscopy uh, in these images shown here. Uh, we access the left chest, looking at the pericardium, we go behind the phrenic nerve as to uh, preserve it and not injure it. Um, and the um, appendage is apparent there and we're able to get that clip on. These are what intraoperative views might be like. The patient's feet are to the left and the head is to the right and it shows the phrenic nerve there uh, running uh, uh, along the screen. And just behind that, we're gonna make a pericardial opening, a pericardial window. And if you're lucky, the cute little appendage pops its head out, just like it's shown in the middle. And uh, on the right, uh, that's what it looks like after we have the clip placed right at its base. And we do that with um, our uh, cardiac anesthesia colleagues. They're doing a transesophageal echo in real time at the time that this clip is placed to make sure that we're getting complete closure at the base uh, so as not to leave a pouch. So I'm gonna go back uh, to my case presentation, uh, kind of where we started um, and uh, as I said, I started with a 77 year old male. Uh, he had long standing persistent AFib for five years, uh, failed endocardial ablation, cardioversion, and medical therapy. And uh, when I saw him, like I said, he was very depressed, just hopeless, uh, but he had heard about this online and was hoping for some help. So he came to my office. I did provide uh, a hybrid treatment with the Convergent Plus procedure. Um, I did a posterior left atrial uh, ablation closed the left atrial appendage with a clip and also provided some extra uh, additional ablation lines along the left side and the roof. Um, and then we did an endocardial mapping and ablation to follow that up. So here it shows uh, the endocardial mapping portion. And on the left side, this is uh, after the surgical procedure, uh, but before any endocardial ablation. Uh, and you can see that the left, uh, this is a view of the left posterior atrial wall. Um, or I'm sorry, the posterior left atrial wall. Uh, red is electrically quiet, which is proof that my surgical ablations did something and I did a good job and they're transmural. Uh, the yellow or green spots at the top are areas where there's still some electrical activity remaining. And then the picture to the right shows the result after the, the endocardial ablation was done to touch up those areas with activity. And it shows complete quiescence of the posterior left atrial wall and also the pulmonary veins, which is exactly the result that, they, that we want. And I'm happy to report that he still remains in normal sinus rhythm. Uh, currently he's only on metoprolol and uh, four years after his hybrid treatment, he claims that he's thriving now that he um, has his life back. So this is what makes all this work really gratifying, just knowing that we can offer treatment and significant improvements to people who really have no other viable options. So in conclusion, um, I've kind of gone through and, and shown that non-paroxysmal AFib can successfully and safely be treated with minimally invasive hybrid procedures, that a hybrid team approach is an excellent way to optimize treatment and reduce the complications associated with AFib, and that new and emerging techniques are safe and effective for treating AFib and should definitely be considered, especially for patients with non-paroxysmal AFib. And this is constantly evolving. So I'm sure there will be a lot more to come. Uh, and I'm really excited about all, all these developments and, and what it means for patients. So I just wanna thank everybody, thank the, the team here at Texas Heart for their support um, because without you guys, we couldn't do what we do. And um, so this is just a list of some people, Dr. Rasek, uh, Dr. John Seeger, Luz Reyes, um, who's very special, uh, Debbie Prelusik, uh, who are two um, nurses in the OR that really helped us uh, get off the ground, uh, Shelly Burkett and the whole CBOR team, um, Raymond Marino, a nurse practitioner who really helps me day in and day out, James Livese for just being an amazing mentor, and um, just the whole Texas Heart Institute and all you guys for um, your ongoing support. So I just wanna thank you so much. <laughs>